passion for this. Thank you for being here today in person and online. And yeah, we're really excited to talk to you about, uh, I think like Natasha said, about running ultras, but really about some of the things that we've learned from running ultras that we think can help when you're doing any hard thing in life and in sport. So who are we? You heard a bit about us, so we won't rehash too much, but just to add a few things, um, I play soccer, I play hockey, I play golf, I play baseball, and I also do run ultra marathons. Um, you can't spend too much time with Kelsey um, without catching the bug. And I've caught the bug, much to my chagrin. And uh, I guess the, this 100 kilometer race I did this past summer was my, my third official ultra. I did 250 kilometer ones before that and uh, DNF'd, uh, did not finish a 110 kilometer race in Quebec, I did 80 kilometers of that. So that's the extent of my ultra marathoning, which is more than I ever thought I would have, so. Uh, and lots of good learning from all of that that so we'll dig into today. Uh, yeah, and I'm Kelsey from Steady Brook, Newfoundland, which is on the West Coast. So yeah, really anything else in addition to what Natasha said, I sort of dabbled in a lot of different sports growing up. So a lot of different, mostly endurance sports. I was a swimmer, triathlon. Uh, I didn't run really until I, I was, graduated from undergrad. That was something I discovered a little bit later. Uh, and yeah, I played all, I played all three first times. So that's sort of the the most of my team sports are from there, but the rest are just running and playing and enjoying being outside a lot of the time. So what is an ultra? Some people I've heard Googled it before coming here to learn a little bit about that. Some people, when we talk about ultra marathons, don't know what an ultra is. So that would be just a little overview. An ultra marathon, very simply put, is any race over the length of a traditional marathon, which is 42 kilometers, or I think that's 26.2 miles, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And what else is there to say <laughs> about ultras? Uh, they are typically, uh, the distances are set distances of maybe 50k, 100k, and 160 kilometers. Uh, within all of those, you know, it might be plus or minus 10k on a course even. We don't really worry too much about the little distances. And this is something that you need to get to know about ultra runners and ultra race organizers is that they do give or take about 10 kilometers it's often. Long. And so you'll get to a race that's supposedly 100k and it's 106.3, <laughs> and, you know, so you have to get used to these things. More miles, more fun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's different formats. So often uh, most of the races that we've done are you all start and do a set distance of a course together, but there's also different formats like uh, run for as many kilometers as you can in a set amount of time, like 12 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. Uh, there are loop courses where everyone does the same loop on the hour every hour until there's one person left. And there's various versions of a last minute standing event. So all of these fall in the category of ultra marathons. Uh, yeah, they're often on remote wilderness trails. So most of the time it's not just straight on the road. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about it is that you get to see really interesting parts of the world. Uh, that you don't often get to see when you're not exploring them by foot. Uh, and that, yeah, they're usually continuous. So like I said, you start and you keep going until you finish. Some people will nap along the way, but most of the time for a race that's 100 miles or less, you will actually just keep going and then fuel up along the way with short breaks at aid stations that are set. And one thing I like to tell people about ultras is that it sometimes helps to imagine a really, really long, fast hike than to imagine a really, really long, fast marathon on the road. Um, when you see an ultra, you'll see people walking, like even some of the, the really elite athletes, uh, like Kelsey, walking up most of the hills. Uh, they'll run the downs, they'll run the flats, but really take their time going up the hills because you know you just can't do it over that length of time. It's very strategic. Uh, it's very cool. much, very yeah. much. I've heard it described as like dancing with the contours of the land. So you're really oh, letting cool. the trail and the course in, like teach you about what it is that you're able to do on that section, where you push for speed or where you need to go slow. And that's like, that was one of the big things for me, transitioning from being a semi road runner to being on the trail and doing ultras was getting used to the idea that I had to listen to the terrain and, and let it slow me down. And that taking breaks was actually a good thing. Uh, because I was used to just powering through a run, thinking that if I stopped, it was a sign of some sort of weakness. And running with Kelsey, there was 
deep, deep frustration and irritation for me in the early days because we would stop and take photos and like, you know, feel the stream or look at the leaves on the trees and things like that. And I, I've learned over time that these are all things that Kelsey does and that many ultra runners do to help them to sustain themselves through these long distances, both mentally and physically. Yeah, anything else you want to say about how, yeah, how did we start running, where have we run, the distances? I guess one of the reasons I think that we're, we wanted to do this together is that we bring a different backgrounds for our ultra running careers. I think like Adams said, it was his first year really running an ultra season, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I started running ultras when I was 21. Uh, I hadn't run a marathon before I heard about ultra running, and I was really intrigued by the idea. Uh, a mentor of mine, Ray Zahab, uh, was organizing a 150 kilometer three day stage race. Uh, and so that was my first ultra marathon that year, and I was hooked. Uh, there was this whole community of people who were just out there exploring trails, getting to know themselves, and like really pushing beyond the things, the limits of what I thought were possible at the time. Um, so since then, I've run a, a handful of races between 50 kilometers uh, up to my longest was 200 miles. So that one took 72 hours and sort of navigated uh, Lake Tahoe in California. And so lots of cool variety. Yeah, and then this most recent race that I did was on Reunion Island off the coast of Madagascar and took us sort of through coast to coast, uh, the mountains and the, the valleys of this incredible uh, island. And the reason I got there was because I won the Quebec Mega Trail. And so they actually have a partnership with that race. Uh, so I had an invitation to compete on reunion, and they supported me with that. Cool. And it's worth saying that you have a history of winning races and being on the podium, I think, without being like overly humble, you could probably say that, right? Yeah, I think it's it's maybe one of the things that was really exciting. Uh, there's there's not a lot of women and there's not a lot of young people in the sport. I think that's something that's changing and growing. And so when I started competing and I just, I, I started, uh, yeah, like I, I came second at my very first ultra and um, that was really exciting too, to start to be able to push for speed. And in my case, a lot of these really longer distances um, be competing with the men too, which I thought was really fun. And for me, my, my introduction to ultra running was Kelsey, I fell in love and then I had to learn how to run ultra marathons. So <laughs> And, <laughs> and so I went from half marathons, uh, that was the longest distance I've done, and I've done them a couple of times, into like a reasonable degree of success. To, of success. I went from ultra marathons, and I would say for the most part, running for the sake of being in shape for other sports, to running for the sake of running. And that transition really happened over this summer, and I'll tell you, it was brutal at times in terms of really the mental shift that I had to make in order to get used to what it meant to go out and train uh, for the purpose of competing in a race. Um, and I, I'm, as I said, a golfer as well. I played three rounds of golf this whole summer because I was out there training, running instead. That was a big hurdle for me because I was, I was thinking, you know, I'd be out there on a run and I would be hurting and I'd go, I don't even like this. This isn't even fun. I could be doing something that I enjoy. And then that would be like a spiral that I had to sort of work to get myself out of. And one of the big keys for me that I sort of tapped into was really accepting that I enjoyed the competition and that that was a real pull for me and a real motivator when I was in the hard moments of training that I could say, oh yeah, one of the reasons I do this is because I enjoy these things. Uh, that's not quite enough to sustain you all the way through the season, but it actually has been quite a help for me to accept that about myself, that I enjoy that competitive aspect of things and that that can be what helps me to keep the pedal down when I'm like training. Um, so for me, I've run, uh, I ran a 50 kilometer race in Hamilton area in Dundas, Ontario. Uh, that was on a rail trail. And that was right before I paced Kelsey out on Lake Tahoe um, at her race there. Uh, pacing is a thing that happens in ultra marathoning and uh, not in every race, more in North America than in Europe, but. Uh, I got to go out with Kelsey while she was kind of a little bit delirious and, you know, late in her race and support her as she ran the trails at Lake Tahoe. And I did about 110 kilometers of that uh, 320 kilometer race with her there. 
Um, and then just this past summer, I, I sort of leveled up and I did my first 100 kilometer race in Newfoundland just outside of Corner Brook and um, managed to come in fourth at that race. So that was pretty, pretty exciting for me. So there you go. That's me. Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Is it on the road or is it in trails above? Because I've been there. So it's on the road. Then. Mostly on trails. Okay, that's what yeah. I mean. So you're above the road. I can, yeah. okay, all right. Um, I, mean, I can picture, it, I can picture it. You so. dip down yeah. to somewhere that's accessible for like age where they have checkpoints set up, but most of it you're up in the, okay. we call it single track, like really wooden trails. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Cool. Okay. Nice cool. Amazing. Yeah. 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 All right, shall we go? Yeah. So why talk to all of you about running ultra marathons? Because some of you might be thinking that you will never run them. Or maybe you will, who knows? And we think we're talking about this because we're all going to do hard things in our lives. And in fact, we all are already doing difficult things in our lives. Um, and we, we often have this conversation when we're talking about ultras. We, of course, think that it would be great for more people to run ultras because they've given a lot to us. But we also think that um, really what we're excited about is people identifying the ultras that they are already running in their lives and maybe bringing some of the insights that you can get from doing an ultra marathon into those parts of their world. Um, because we think that the things that you're already doing are fantastic and we just hope that you um, can support yourselves to do them in the best way possible. Yeah. Anything more to say about that? No, I think that's good. Yeah, and, and so this is, I think, just going off of that, a reminder that you can think of coaching as one of your ultra marathons. Yeah. So when you are going through a really uh, busy period, maybe preparing for Canada Games with your athletes, so that that can be considered your own ultra in your life. and so. Thinking of some of the tools and practices that we'll share as things that you can apply to support yourself, um, but also things that maybe you can work with your athletes on. Um, so we we think you your own performance is just as important as the performance of your athletes too. And we we were talking before about just thinking thinking along the lines of what are some of the different areas of your life that you might be able to apply some of these tools. And we talked about coaching as one area, and then we we're also saying you're probably all athletes in some way or another in your own right. And so if you're out there for your like 5K or you're out there doing whatever it is that you do for your own uh, wellness or your own athletic pursuits, you, know, you can try some of these things out because there's really no better way to, to uh, start to, to think about the things that are useful than seeing what works for yourself. Yeah. So that's it. So this is what we're calling uh, mental strategies for doing hard things. And this is Ralph, our current service puppy who admittedly likes running for about two minutes and then finds it very difficult. So he's implementing some of these practices too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and perhaps reminds us not to take ourselves entirely too seriously as we're yeah. applying these strategies <laughs> to our athletic pursuits. So the first practice uh, that we'd like to share is to know your story. And when I was thinking about this, uh, one of the first things that I like to ask people when they're thinking about setting goals is to sort of backtrack first and say, why is it that you want to be doing this thing? What is the motivation for you? Um, when, I, when I'm running a really long race, when things get hard, I can revisit my why. So I go back to like, why do I want to do this? Even though it's really hard, even though my feet are blistered and my legs hurt and everything is pain, why am I doing this? Uh, and so, Actually spending some time with that, writing it down and talking about it out loud. Um, we'll discuss that sort of heading into the season sometimes of why am I doing this race even? And, and I can revisit that afterwards when, when things start to get a little tough. Uh, and then when it comes to setting goals, there's a few different ways that I actually like to do that. Um, so I, I think of different layers of goal setting. And the first one is, uh, I think, something that a lot of people are familiar with, which is setting short and long-term goals. And uh, really, that's like thinking of your really big outcome goal that's down the road and thinking of the milestones that'll help you get there along the way. Uh, the second piece is pop goals. So you might have heard these terms before, but process, outcome, and performance goals. So those are three different kinds of goals that you might set for any given performance. Uh, so an example of each of those for a race. A uh, process goal would be focused on 
the things that I'm doing in my training or during the race that help me get to the finish line in the way that I want to. Uh, an outcome goal is focused on uh, the competitive outcome. So this is where I might stand in, in terms of someone else. So I might hope, I, I would hope you win a race. That would be how. Uh, and a performance goal is focused on a competitive standard. So in running, that would be like, I want to make it in, in under 37 hours for this race. Uh, and then for all of these goals, I like to use a strategy of doing uh, ABC goals. So output goal setting. And what that might look like in a really concrete example uh, is when, like when I headed into my race on race weekend, there were a ton of unknown factors. I'd never competed in a European race. I'd never competed against such a huge field of women and huge field of competitors. competitors. There were 3,000 runners. Uh, and also, there was just a lot of unknown factors. The race crossed from south to north of the island, and there was extremes of weather and terrain all the way along. So I knew that I might have to adjust to whatever the situation was. So with that in mind, I had different layers of goals. My A goal, uh, was a shoot for the moon, like everything working perfectly, what am I going to do? And I had an A process outcome and performance goal. So that, that A goal was, you know, I thought possibly I could podium. And, and that was my outcome. Uh, my B outcome goal was, okay, if I can't podium, maybe I can get top 10. That would be really cool. Uh, and then my C goal was, okay, if that's out the window during the run, then like, I just want to finish. That would feel really, really great. And to be a finisher in a race is of this distance is huge. Um, yeah, and you can do those layers of goals with all the different kinds. And for me, that really helps uh, as information changes, like in an ultra, it really does on the fly, that then I can change my goals and stay motivated to keep going and readjust to information along the way. Yeah, that's it. I should say that Kelsey pushed me through or invited me into the process of getting to know my why last summer in relation to running. Um, and one of the things that I think was really interesting about it is that it actually got me in touch with some of the, the things that I was actually kind of like ashamed of or part of my lot. Um, and one of those things was actually like the competitiveness that I spoke about earlier. And I was able to sort of work through that and then embrace it and accept it in a positive way. And so I think that's like some of the like, the gold or the like shiny stuff that can be uncovered if you sit with those questions of why uh, long enough and you uncover layers as time goes on. My why got more and more robust. And the more answers I had to that question, the more I had to draw on when I was able to. Mm -hmm. there's, my, there's my plug for asking about your why and getting to know it. All right. This next part is, um, I think. One of the main strategies that I use when I'm running, and I refer to it as talking to your parts or talking to my parts. Um, it's kind of a funny language. Uh, it comes from a uh, method, a therapeutic method called internal family systems, actually. And uh, they talk about parts as being almost like sub personalities within each person. And like many of us say these kind of things just in passing, we'll be like, oh, part of me's not feeling like going to work today, or like a part of me doesn't like you know, want to run tonight or whatever it is. And this method basically invites you to take that seriously and say, well, that actually is like a real part of who you are. And you can have a conversation with them um, and you can get to know that part. Um, and there's a whole method here that I won't go deep in. If you're interested in it, I really recommend looking it up because there's lots of cool like self-knowledge that's available and I'm doing some training on it in the, in the spring. So, you know, come and talk to me if you're interested. But um, the one thing that I started doing when I was running is having some conversations with the parts of me that showed up while I was running. And so in order to do that, what I first do is I kind of I'll be out on the trail and I'll start noticing thoughts or emotions or sensations that are coming up for me. So it might be something like, oh, I'm never going to finish. Or it might be, um, I'm feeling like I'm going to, I'm feeling dizzy. Or it might be, uh, I feel anxious. Those are like sort of some of the scarier thoughts that emerge for me. Might also be like, this is going great. Or like, um, oh yeah, it's like I'm way ahead of my goals. Um, and so I kind of, what I've learned to do is, and I think ultras really lend themselves to this because I always say like the, the space between 
like yourself and your emotions kind of disappears when you're exhausted and out there running ultras. And so I find it actually really a great venue for me to have a conversation and find out what those different parts of me have to say. So I'll literally get curious and say, okay, like dizziness or anxiousness, like, how are you? Like, how are you feeling? Right now? Like, what do you have to tell me? What is it that you want me to know? And what I'll often find is with the emotions that are a little more disturbing, I'll really be kind of harsh with them at first. And I realize, man, if that was a person, they would not want to talk to me, right? Like if, if Kelsey was like saying, showed up at my house and was really anxious and I was like, what do you want? You know, like stop talking to me. She would just run away and leave, right? And so what I've learned to do is I've learned to start to welcome in some of those emotions in those parts and let them kind of travel with me through the run. And so as I do that, I start to kind of like lessen the power that they have over me because we get to know each other. So this happened to me out on the trail at a race called Quebec Mega Trail uh, this summer. And I was going up a, a hill and I, I actually just like out of nowhere just started to feel like my like almost like my chest tighten a little bit. I started to feel anxious. And I just started to have this conversation with this anxious part of him and found out why it was there. And at first it told me something along the lines of like, you just really need to stop right now because this is the same thing. As, as I like talked to it, I said, you know, like, how much do you really believe is true? And as the race went on and as I kept moving through the, the time, as I spent more time with it, it said, you know what, actually, I think you can keep going. Um, and so I said, well, thanks for letting me know. Thanks for being concerned about me. And, uh, you know, if there's anything else that comes out through the course of the race, like you just show up again and, and you know, let me know. And so when I do that, uh, I do my best once they show up and once I have that kind of conversation to thank them, I express my gratitude um, and I invite them to stick around. I say, you know what, like you want to hang out on my shoulder and just kind of like keep an eye on things, look for those things you're concerned about, go ahead. Um, and then as I put down there, I, I tend to negotiate a bit of a plan with these, these parts of myself as well and say, you know, how can we work together to achieve the goals that we have? So if I know that I need, you know, maybe 10 more hours to, to get to the, the line, I'll say, you know, how do you feel about giving me a bit of support for 10 more hours? What is it you can offer um, to me as I work towards the finish line? Um, and before I move off that, I'll just say, like, I do this a little bit. Kelsey does it a bit more. Uh, but I do this a bit with actual body parts also. So I don't tend to like talk to my feet. Kelsey will do that a little more and she can talk about it. But what I tend to do is I tend to find the emotions and thoughts and say, okay, like I'm noticing that like my feet are hurting a little bit. Like what is it that we as parts of me can do together to support our feet right now? Or like if my stomach is feeling like a bit unsettled, I'll say like, what can we do what can we offer to my digestive system right now? Because you know what, like, like we haven't really been treating it very well and it's doing a whole lot for us to get us to the end of this place. So that's parts. Yeah, I think I, I find that particularly helpful. Like when, you know, a lot of people ask, like, don't you ever, ever feel scared or nervous or any of these emotions that so many athletes are working through that uh, you're not just shoving them away and saying that they aren't there to acknowledge them and to accept, like for me, Adam sort of hinted, like a lot hurts. There's a lot of physical pain in these races. And most of the time I will check in with those and say like, okay, thank you for being here. Right now, I actually don't need to give you a ton of attention. I just want to acknowledge and accept that you're there, but we're gonna keep running for the next 10, 20 hours together. So you know, like, let's do this together rather than say that doesn't exist. And there's a bit of like nice nuance there that I find really helpful. It's kind of, we talk sometimes about like the attitude that you have towards the sensation or the emotion or the thought that you notice in your body. Um, and I find even like right now, I'm like, I have like a little, I have a little Achilles injury that I've been working on and I have a plan for it. So my attitude towards it is like pretty relaxed and calm and I know what I'm doing and I feel pretty, you know, uh, in control of the situation. But I think like early on, I was feeling like more worried and nervous and hesitant about it. So that would have impacted my performance, I think, if I was like running. Um, and this is like just, just a quick caution to say that I think that often when you are doing this kind of inner work, 
you may encounter, it is possible that you or your athletes would encounter like parts of themselves that are really disturbing um, that might have come from like past traumas or things like that. And so it's just to say that if those things happen, that's that's very normal. And that those are probably the kind of things that you might want to work with a, you know, a therapist or a counselor or something like that on. Um, and that that's not necessarily something that, that you as a coach need to feel like you have to, to dive into with an athlete. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think, just a very normal thing if that would be, if that was something that happened for people. Tosi, have you been using this sort of like four parts of the top two parts of your athletes that you've been doing little NPC work with? It's an interesting process. This, like, I feel like I'm still learning a lot of this. Cool. Adam yeah. it has really taught me a lot of this language and I found it helpful. Uh, and so like, I, I do a little bit frame athletes up with that and like yeah. that understanding of, well, this is like a part of you that is feeling that. Yeah, it's so, like, it's a neat structure. Yeah. Like, it's one that from even seeing it, I thought, okay, like teenage athletes and young adults could yeah. grasp onto and kind of understand and explore some of the yeah. emotional side. I think mm-hmm. there's like a whole cool. session on that. Yeah. yeah. Very exciting. I'm, I'm cool. excited. Adam mentioned he's doing a, yeah, a therapeutic training on this in, in oh. the winter that yeah. uh, awesome. he'll be able to then work with people on this sort of uh, strategy. And so uh, I'm excited to learn more about it. Neat tie to performance, though, for sure. Yeah, I'm really excited oh, about that. Like the um, the guy who developed the model is uh, he talks about being a basketball player when he was younger, and and yeah. how he's, he has a part that doesn't actually care about what anybody thinks, which is sometimes like not the best part to have. He says like no when he's talking to his spouse or whatever. It's like that's not really that helpful. Um, so I try to ask it to step back when we're doing that. But he said, when I'm playing basketball, sometimes oh, right. I can say, yeah. you know what, come forward and help me perform right now and like take a little bit more control over me, right yeah. now, which is like a really skilled process and takes a little bit of time to get that sort of aware. Uh, but I think there's really lots of applications to sport. So I'm excited to play for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Move it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, visualize your performance was our third practice and strategy. Uh, and a couple of ways that we actually use this and that I tend to use this in preparing for ultras. Um, when we talk about visualization, we're really often talking about practicing something in your mind. And so running through all of the different scenarios for a race, for a game. Uh, and the way that I actually practice that is in the weeks leading up to a big race. I'll start imagining all of the possible scenarios. And I imagine the best scenarios, like I imagine what it would be like if I was beating Courtney DeWalter, who's like one of the best ultra marathoners in the world. I imagine that so that I'm able to prepare my mind and my body for what that could be like. I I also spend a lot of time imagining things going wrong. And so I actually walk myself through what kind of problems I expect would happen, what kind of problems I can't predict might happen, and how I would problem solve those and react uh, along the way. And so some of the things that I do that help to help with that visualization, when we talk about visualization, we really want to use as many senses as possible in that imagery. So the more that you can immerse yourself in uh, understanding what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, and it sounds like uh, is really helpful. But that's not always possible, you know, in, in running when you haven't been to a course uh, beforehand. Often you don't get a chance to spend much time on the trail before you race. Um, so I'll, I'll do things like watch videos, I'll listen to podcasts, I'll like look at photos, talk to people who've run it before and get a real sense of where I'll be competing. So like uh, I mentioned, this was one of the bigger races that I'd ever done, this one on Reunion. And there was this mass start with fireworks. That's the start. That's the start. Yeah, like thousands of competitors, thousands of people cheering you on, music, it started at 9 p.m. at night. And I knew that that was like, Ooh, that's going to be something very different that I've never experienced. And so I watched all these videos of it. I thought about how I wanted to experience that. And I imagined myself channeling that energy as like motivation up the mountain. Uh, and knowing that that would be something different, the more that I could practice that, the more useful it was. So, you know, if you're thinking of your athletes going to competitions that might be unfamiliar, anything that they can do to get a sense of what that might feel like and look like would be really helpful. Yeah, and even like IRL in real life, if you can actually get there and use all of your senses to experience what it is, uh, that's really helpful. Like this course, I did a bit of scouting on the trail 
So I got to run a few sections and I really soaked up like what it felt like, what it looked like, and relived that in my head in the days leading up to the race. So that when I came to it, it felt so familiar. And I felt like I could channel that into familiar. You went early, right, Foxy? Yeah, yeah. I was really fortunate to be able to go up uh, like a full week in advance. And we scattered about like four, three to four different sections of trail. Like any athlete, any sport. <laughs> <laughs> totally, completely. Yeah, I think that like helps with the familiarity and then really being intentional about that, like visualizing it because I've experienced it then made such a difference. We have a question online. I'm just yeah. going to drop now. Could happen yeah, anytime. Sure. But um, Chris is curious if Kelsey has ever had the opportunity to meet David Goggins. No, I David haven't. Goggins. David Goggins. Yep. I haven't, but I, he is very well known in like the ultra and during the hiking nods. Yeah. One day. Oh. Sorry, All right. they started in the evening. Yeah. 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 Is um, there a like planned like rest time or do? Yeah, that's a great question. So that race, it, it started at 9 p.m. Uh, and that is the case for a lot of ultras uh, that take quite a long time. I think in order to try and straddle as many people finishing in daylight as possible, um, that is a big thing. Or also like this race had a 66 hour time cut off. So started Thursday night, final competitive competitors were finishing on Sunday in the day, which meant that sort of the weekend ended with the race ending. And so that might be some reasons for it. With that, like for people who were going to be out on the course for that long, uh, they did have nap stations set up at a few of the different aid stations where people planned to sleep or in some of the longer ones I've done, sometimes you just pull off on the side of the trail and have a quick nap and set a timer and keep going. But I mean, when you start, for me, I, I started at night and then I got to see two sunrises in one week period, which is pretty cool. Did you uh, sleep at all or no? I closed my eyes for five minutes of this one, uh, okay. set a timer. Just, I, I was at the top of a really hard section about like 115 kilometers in, where I had my lowest low that I've ever had in a race before. Uh, it was just, yeah, a never ending climb. I started having like self doubt. My watch died. Uh -oh. uh, and so I got there and I was like, I just need a reset. And I curled up, closed my eyes for five minutes. I might have slept. I don't know. And then kept going. Another good strategy right there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a really good example too of how like your your goals sort of influenced your strategy a little bit too because because you were planning on being done in a length of time mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily require you to sleep mm. and so I, like I think you would would say that if you had been needing to stay out there for much longer than it took you you might have had to revisit your sleep strategy totally. Um, I actually don't know. Is that something you had like visualized or planned for as one of the things that could have gone wrong, or was it, that was that even like a bit of an unknown? Yeah, I really, I did knowing like the layers of goals for this one. I had no idea if I would be faster than thirty hours, like some of the fastest competitors this year finished in uh, just under twenty three for the men and just over twenty four for the women. Uh, and I thought maybe I would be pretty fast and I could like podium and be under thirty hours. Um, but I also kept stretching my range back. 37 was really near like the end end of my range, but there was a scenario I imagined where no matter what I was gonna finish and I knew it was a 66 hour cutoff and I knew that if I needed to, I could have like a full night sleep going if I put myself in a position where I could do that. So I was prepared to stop and sleep if I needed to. Mm -hmm. The next strategy that we were thinking about talking about here is, is practicing self-compassion. And uh, there's many ways you can practice self-compassion. These are just a couple of the tools that uh, we thought about. Um, the first one here is uh, playing the switch game. Um, and I learned this from a doctor and psychotherapist that I work with in Oakville. Uh, her name's Dr. Amy Alexander. And she works a lot with people who experience chronic pain and chronic illness. And one of the things that she works on is um, inviting people after a period of time to start to substitute the word sensation for the word pain. Um, and that's, there's a whole bunch of like neuroscience reasons for that. But the short version is that there, there isn't actually a pain center in our brain. There is uh, a way that our brain interprets signals sent from our body as pain based on the way that we, um, you know, have been conditioned and conditioned ourselves to think about it. 
Um, and so that isn't to say that there, there aren't problems some places. Um, and she's always really very careful to make sure that when people are experiencing pain, and that's the word they use that says your pain is real. It's definitely real. Um, but when people start to shift their mindset a little bit, a little bit about it and say, what I'm experiencing right now is actually sensational. So if I just, you know, press on my finger, I feel a sensation and my brain knows that it's a safe sensation. Um, and so that's just an example of a switch that you can make. And so I do that out on the trail sometimes with other language that might make me feel disturbed or scared or upset. Um, so like, you know, things like, uh, like I'm, uh, I'm so stupid for making that mistake, for, for making that mistake, right? If you can just say switch to your athlete and say, you know, I made a mistake that happens, right? Then it sort of lessens the impact that it might have on your performance. Okay. Um, another one that I use a lot is this, uh, this switch between I am and a part of me. So if I say like, I am sad, then it's like the whole of me is sad. Like all of me is sad, which is very rarely true. Even if it's just like a tiny pinprick, there's probably like a part of me that is feeling a different way. And so I find if I say part of me is sad, then it takes a little bit of the weight and a little bit of the heaviness away from um, that sort of full self experience of an emotion. Um, and you can play a switch game with any that you find is sort of demotivating to your athlete or to yourself or your coach. Um, and Sometimes it's just kind of a light way if you if you teach people the switch word, you can say uh, switch, um, and they might be invited into uh, a different way of understanding the situation. And the second one is the power of yet. Um, it's a pretty simple one. Uh, I haven't scored yet. Uh, I haven't finished yet. I haven't landed that trick yet. Um, and most sentences uh, of self-criticism, if you put the word yet at the end of them, uh, have a little bit of hope at the end. Um, and we talked a little bit about how that is sort of a bit of a growth mindset kind of a way of thinking. So those are a couple self-compassion ideas. Oh yeah. And then we, we chatted a lot about focus uh, and focusing when it matters. So in an ultra, uh, if you were to be really honed in and focused and have your attention on running the entire time, whew, that's a long time to be focused. That's like not really even possible all the time. Uh, and I think this this is something I actually chatted about with Lori at the very beginning of my master's as a golfer. Like sometimes it's really hard during a round of golf to stay focused the entire time too. So focusing when it matters and having strategies on how to do that uh, is really quite useful. So uh, some of the things that we might use are developing cues to maintain concentration. And often these are really instructional cues for me. So in a race, uh, I as I'm heading into a checkpoint or an aid station, uh, there's a few things that I might plan on doing. So I'm going through in my head a routine so that when I get there, I know exactly what I need to do. I need to refill my water in my backpack. I need to change my snacks. I need to switch this up. And so, that's like a very acute moment when I need to maintain that concentration and focus. Uh, I also have other cues like uh, eat every 30 minutes. So on my watch, I know that I'm continually getting that like reminder to eat. Uh, also things like lift my feet over a really tricky section if I know that uh, my mind is starting to go and I actually do need to focus on not tripping and twisting an ankle. I'll have things that I say in my head, lift my feet. And you say this one. Yeah, I say touch, touch, touch to keep my cadence up. Uh, to keep my feet coming off the ground and coming down again at the right pace. Yeah, and so just for different people, different words and cues might work. Uh, and a lot of the time, these are things that we'll, we will plan beforehand. So I'll know during a race that I can go back to revisit some of these cues. They're not things that I then have to think of on the fly. Uh, and then the other piece too is thinking about where your attention is. So Sometimes there are moments when I need to be focused on what's happening inside of my body, like what's going on, what are my thoughts, uh, and, and I need to be spending that time reminding myself of that. Sometimes I really actually want to focus outwards and I want to take in where I am. So what's happening around me? Is there anything I need to be aware of uh, that I need to focus on? And <laughs> I'll intentionally do that shift of my attention and focus. Uh, and then when it comes to things that are happening outside of me, Sometimes I'll notice things like a storm brewing or like 
really muddy sections of trail. And these are really good things to focus on and notice, but not spend too much time on. So I've, I've developed a practice of accepting the things that are out of my control when I notice them. So being aware of these things and taking stock of what's happening, but also just saying, I accept them, they're part of what's happening. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time thinking about them. And then <laughs> I like productive distraction makes this sound very uh, fancy, but really there are times when it's just fine to let your mind wander and to allow yourself to sort of uh, like dissociate from the intense focus of what you're doing. So uh, there's a lot of times that I actually find running quite meditative and I can just let my body go. My feet know how to move. The trail is really smooth. So we'll do things like sing songs in my head or out loud. Uh, I'll notice the birds singing, especially before sunrise. Uh, I really like to take that in. Uh, I'll appreciate the views or like we actually both do this, but I think especially you just like counting, counting in your head as you're going. Yeah. The only one I just wanted to add, just because it's like my favorite thing, is part of golf. I know I was listening to a podcast the other day, and the golfer was talking about having a butt, like that he he draws a red circle and sharpie on his glove, and when it's time to start his swing, he presses the button. Like yeah, himself it like puts himself cool. in his routine, and then it's like a cue to start his routine. Um, that was really cool, and. Uh, Lori's insight about dropping your focus in a round of golf was huge for me because, yeah, I, mean, I had this thought that I had focused for five hours <laughs> straight, right? And it's impossible. And so it's actually really nourishing to drop that focus at certain points when you know that you can. This one is turn it up uh, or down. Uh, so you may have, you may have heard of grounding practices, uh, things that maybe bring you into the present and you're either a little bit up or actually also maybe a little bit down. Um, and so I kind of think of grounding as like you might be like kind of digging yourself back up to the top of the like to the surface or kind of like maybe pulling yourself down out of the clouds or out of a place of really high activation. And so here are just a few uh, that I use out in the trail. Um, a three three three. You can add more threes if you want. Basically, this is um, three things you can see, three things you can hear, three things you can feel. If you want to engage smell, you can engage smell. Just a nice way to either, if you're really tired, get yourself active again, or if you're feeling way up, to bring you down um, into a place where you can then maybe make different decisions about how you want to respond to a certain circumstance. Uh, counted breath. There's lots of different ways to do this. Uh, some people do it with a hold. Some people do it without a hold. What I tend to do is just um, I'll try and uh, inhale and then exhale for longer than my inhale. Uh, when I'm running, I find that quite difficult and actually quite uh, it can be quite anxiety inducing sometimes too. Um, so I don't always I don't do it too too often. But it is something that if I say stop to walk for a bit. Um, I will sometimes do that because it can help to bring like a sense of calm to your system if you can sort of execute it. Um, another one is tapping or padding or whatever. Uh, there's like lots of traditions that have, um, you know, rhythmic traditions around drumming and around singing or chanting or these kind of things. Um, and there's, there's like reasons for that. And so we can sort of mimic that by giving our body certain kinds of rhythmic experiences. So when I'm out running, sometimes if I'm feeling like, you know, a certain way, I'll just like do this for a little while, or I might do this or, you know, whatever it is that I feel like I need. Um, and again, it just kind of brings me into the present. Uh, quick talking, this is a fun one. Uh, if you really, again, if you're feeling really tired, you might really want to pick up the pace of your speech and talk really, really fast because it's really, really exciting. And then you'll want to run more. Um, but uh, I do that uh, every once in a while. It's very disturbing. Um, and then uh, the opposite is also true. Uh, you can slow down your speech and it kind of brings you down again. But uh, another Towel or tissue toss. I don't think I have anything to demonstrate this with, but basically, if you had a piece of tissue paper or a Kleenex, right, you could just throw it like this and watch it float. And again, if you want to watch it float slowly, that's great. If you want to like um, use it as a way to activate your system, you can also like grab it, whatever. Uh, do it with a towel uh, at an aid station. That's something that I could do. 
Uh, figure eights, very simple, just like in the air. I'll just do figure eights like this. And again, you got a lot of time we're doing an ultra C trial, so it's weird things. Um, and so I'll just do that. Um, and then see the horizon, or there's, this is a Hawaiian practice um, called Hakalao. Um, and basically what you do is you can look it up online. Um, and there's sort of like a deep spiritual history to this tradition. And there's like lots of uh, ways that you, if you were going to uh, want to honor it in a full way, you could. But the basic concept is that you would hold your thumbs out like this and then find a point just beyond them, uh, like on the wall or on the horizon, and then slowly move your hands apart like this. And as you do that and keep focused on that space on the horizon, your gaze kind of widens and you get more awareness of your peripheral vision. And when you drop your hands, you have that broader perspective. So often when I'm running on the trail, I'll get really focused on like making sure I'm not falling. And so, and then I'll start to really feel like my world is shrunk. So I'll do that to help open myself back up. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, ultras, although we spend a lot of time alone on the trail, uh, they're actually a really, oppor really cool opportunity to bring people along and share the experience. And so, this piece is about engaging with your community. Uh, and uh, in Ultras, we have something called a support group that you can have for bigger races. So I've actually had like my parents and friends and Adam come out to meet me at different checkpoints along the way during the race to support me. Uh, and also to uh, support me after the race when I really need it. And to plan that in advance is so helpful uh, as I'm building my team and I'm thinking about my running, being intentional about how I'm going to ask for help uh, makes a really big difference to that experience too. Um, I sometimes actually have to teach them how to support me. So asking them and being really clear in, in before a race, we get to sit down together and I'll say, these are the things that I need. This, this is the kind of stuff that I want to hear. Um, these are the things that you could do to offer me support. That's really helpful to do together too. Uh, and then you also get to celebrate your successes together. So when you share it, you get to make these memories and you get to, uh, yeah, have a great time and have this wonderful experience all together too. Uh, it's also a great way to share your journey, or it, it's a lot. It's a lot of fun to share your journey and a great way to build community. Uh, maybe, oh, Natasha. Yeah, I have a question. Just with yeah. building your team, because I actually had a Canadian coach ask me this question today. Yeah. Um, you know, I encouraged her to assign roles to her manager, really? and she had a great question. She goes, "Well, what should I ask them to do?" So I was like, oh, great question. And so I gave her some examples, but how did you kind of discover the support for you that you wanted to assign? Yeah, that's a very good question. But that's an internal one. So was, yeah. 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 And I think it's the first time I've now had a support crew on a couple of races. And I started by running more self supported. And then the first time I just said, well, come and be on my support crew. Yeah. And so the actual, I think I skipped yeah. over it, but the wording here was assign roles. And yeah being very intentional about like, okay, now that I've done this a couple of times, and even if I haven't done it, that this coach, like you could think about what is it that I'm gonna need? So like running through the actions of what's gonna happen um, during that event. So for me, like thinking about as I come into an aid station, someone can be responsible for my food, someone can be responsible for uh, checking in with like, if there's any questions that I have about the next section of the course and can tell me that, uh, and then someone else can be responsible for taking pictures and updating social media. And like being really clear about what those roles are is helpful, I think. And and it makes it more efficient if it's happening too. But yeah, how did I think of them? I think just like really focusing on what the actual actions would be and thinking about what I would do or what I would want to do by myself and then what I could offer for some, or like what I could invite someone else to do for me instead. I so think I can the important part too is that you had to take time to think about it and kind of work yourself through it. Yeah. And then so you could do this. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like I can't sit down with my crew to talk about the race until I've done my own walk through what the course is going to be yeah. and what I'm going to do the whole time. So I do like a whole prep before I bring my group into it. And if some of the stuff's preparatory, you have to be able to let go. Totally. But myself, oh. I have a hard time. Letting someone else do something in some cases, and, and because oh, I wouldn't do it that way. 
yeah. right? So it's, it's you, know, you, need to be going, you know what, it's benefit. Oh. It's yeah. maybe, I think running ultras has taught me that more than anything else, because truly by the end of some of these longer races, I'm not capable of making decisions and I'm not oh, capable right. of physically doing things. And so that letting go piece, whew, that's a really big lesson because I like doing it all and I have a way that I would like to do it. But I've actually had to then, yeah, accept that someone else might do it differently and beforehand tell them how I would like them to do it. So there's like a little bit of a balance there of both. Mm -hmm. You want to talk to this yeah. In terms of sharing your journey, I mean, you can do that in all sorts of ways. Some of the ways that we do it, um, we'll do we'll do Instagram stories relatively regularly about how the training's going, about how things are how things are progressing. Uh, we did a newsletter for one of Kelsey's the race she did on uh, Reunion Island. We engaged people that way. Um, something really simple, like you can call friends. Like you could just have nothing. Everything doesn't have to be like a, a social media platform. You could just make a list of three people that you want to keep updated on your training or on your uh, on your experience, and you could just have a schedule and call them to let them know how things are going. Um, this one, make a mixtape of motivation. Uh, I did something kind of cool and for my race uh, this race season this summer, and uh, I emailed a group of people from my life, from actually quite like divergent parts of my life, and I asked them for their insight on uh, self-compassion. I asked them, like, how do you support yourself when you're doing hard things? And they actually recorded little short audio messages for me, and I put them together into a audio track, and then I played one every 10 kilometers in the race that I ran. Um, and so yeah. there was a really nice little, like, community that I had, you know, at my fingertips kind of and it was like they were they were with me both like in the sound of their voice but also just kind of in a nice little uh way um and I think it was uh exciting too to know that I you know before the race I sent them a message and said it's about to start and this is what's going to happen and here's how you follow along and uh, after the race I was able to kind of you know give them a little insight into how it was. so um, that's one little thing that I tried this year that was really fun and then uh, something that Kelsey does and that I've started to do as well is write race reports afterwards. And, um, that's just a fun way of, you know, letting people know what it was that you planned for um, and sharing. So I think like last point on this one that feels important is like what I've learned about sharing it is that it gives people an opportunity to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of athletes and, and people are doing really cool things. And so it, it's, you know, it, it sometimes feel selfish I find or like I feel like it's very hard to talk about what I'm doing but then when I start to I realize how excited other people are and that like that energy passes on and carries on and that like help starts to appear in places too that I wouldn't have expected it to happen so sharing it is actually like a, a I started to think of it as like an offering that I can make to other people and that I hope that they would give that back to mm -hmm. a message to all coaches too because I find coaches they're very quiet yeah. On online, on their own sharing. Yeah. Yeah. I've had to work through that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for anybody that's maybe more of like an analog person, like thinking about those ways that you might share that are sort of offline too yeah. is like a really cool thing. Like again, like we talked about calling friends when you can go to yeah. coffee shops, you could have little conversation groups, yeah. or you could write letters, or, you know, as you know, Christmas cards or holiday greeting or whatever it is and put a little information in there and just uh, set up rhythms that make sense for you and, and work with the way that your social circle works. And our last practice here is to make it fun. Which I think we've done that in a lot of different ways, but you know, we've hinted at sometimes how these things can be really hard and and I think in a lot of sports a lot of things that we're doing in life. Um, I guess like an aside for my thesis research, I've been interviewed people who were running for 12 months. And a couple of the women in the study compared it to childbirth, which you know I thought was very fascinating. And they had some strategies there around like, or they, they discussed how like obviously it's not fun the whole time, but there are ways that you can find it fun or remind yourself of the fun along the way when it is hard. And so, you know, things that we'll do during races are things like creating a mini game. So run to the next tree and use that as a magnet. And I get this like boost of endorphins when I do that. Or uh, create an obstacle course. This is something you do. Yeah, just <laughs> usually in training where like I'll just be sort of 
annoyed and I'll need something to perk me up and I'll you know I'll, I'll say I'm gonna do circles around every tree before I keep running or I'll do like I'll like you know ring around the like the no parking sign or whatever yeah and like I I whoop but I yell and I cheer people on it's like it's so much fun when you're out there to share it and to to make it fun for other people too we were running a 50k in May and it was like a really drizzly rainy day Adam and I were both doing this race and there was one section we both tend to like woo on the downhills because that's just something that's fun. When it's your, you know, plain arms out, down the hill, have fun. Uh, and I could hear Adam whooping somewhere off in another part of the place. Which is that amazing because of how far Kelsey was ahead of me at that point. <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and you could also like make a list of phrases that motivate you. So this sort of falls into the category of like self talk. So things that you might want to say to yourself that are exciting, motivating, pump you up. Uh, you, yeah, you did this for putting with your watch too. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's yeah, there. and then this this sort of falls back to the, like teaching people how to support you. Like tell your friends the things that you like to hear, or like if you have parents or other athletes that are cheering each other on, learn what it is that actually motivates them. That'd be a fun activity for the athletes to share. Yeah, with, like in a group too, if they're open enough. Because people don't actually like always hearing the same thing. We've no. learned that. Yeah. yeah, we we uh, we sat down. Kelsey's parents graciously offered to crew me during my race in Newfoundland this summer, and um, Kelsey's family is particularly skilled at positive reinforcement um, and finding the opportunity and the challenge and these things. And I love that too. Um, However, when I'm out there running, I actually like to be the positive one. And so I actually trained them a little bit on maybe being a bit sarcastic with me when I was out there. Uh, and so I, I said, when I come into an aid station, I actually would just love to hear you say, man, running sucks, doesn't it? And uh, so they, it was very difficult. My mom yelling, Adam, running sucks. <laughs> it just made me smile, right? And so and then it's a, it's fun, it's great, right? Uh, yeah. But I think it, it said to me, you know, oh, don't you love this? I would have been inclined to go, yeah, except I'm really hurting right now. Um, so yeah. it, it is a fun thing to teach people the kinds of things that really can motivate you, spur you on, because they may be sort of surprising. We did this with the uh, Dow cross country team, the women's team, uh, two years ago, heading into a really big competition. Learned that we sort of had like two worlds of things, which I think are sort of represented by either you really like hearing positive things or you really like hearing like hard work truth. Yeah. Uh, and so we had people planted that knew what to say to each person. Uh, and yeah, this last piece is like prepare your comfort kit or your fun kit or your like, what can I draw on that'll make me feel really excited. Uh, and for me, like when I'm, I'm running a race, uh, food especially, you have to fuel constantly while you're running an ultra. And sometimes I just do not want the food that I've packed. So I have like a secret stash of fuzzy peach rings that I wait and save until like I really, yeah. They're my like, oh, yes, I get to eat my fuzzy peach rings now. And I'm really excited about it. And I have something I can go to, but you could do that too with like music. You'll, you'll make like a fun running playlist uh, or packing gear, like fun colors that make you feel really excited too. So just a couple of ways to make it fun. Sometimes before a race, I will, uh... Buy, like buy a snack that I really want to eat and then not eat it intentionally before the race so that then I really want it but like I'm thinking about it through the race because again with ultras you really need to you know work on fuel right um, so that's a thing I do and I like the neon colored things they just work for me so yeah. that's, a, that's a little comfort thing I do and so I guess just before we wrap up we thought that with great knowledge maybe come a few tips for success. Um, and so just a few thoughts. We reviewed a lot of different strategies and we suggested a lot of things and brought a lot at you. And so just a few things to think about how to land them um, in your own practice and to maybe um, lessen the load. So one thing is when you're trying new things, um, try them one at a time or maybe two at a time. Um, and don't feel like you have to like, I would say like eat the whole pizza all at once. You can take it slice by slice and find out which ones work for you and which ones don't. Um, practice these tools at practice, you know? Um, it's hard to learn a new tool when you're trying to perform um, and it's hard to call on one that you don't know. Um, so putting them into place and practice is great. 
Um, when it gets hard, get curious, uh, meaning that if you notice a little bit of like maybe resistance to one of the tools, um, that's a great opportunity to ask yourself why. Um, and usually there's some uh, interesting things in there. And if you don't find the interesting part, just put it on the shelf and you might need it some other day. You might take it off the shelf. Um, and integrate these into your life outside of sport as well. Uh, you know, the office can be a good place to try out some of these things. It can support you to do the ultras that you're doing uh, in your work as well. We talked about before this that like these are things that we might use over the course of an entire season or a year of running and not all in one race. Yeah. So you know, see what resonates for you and know that these are all tools in your toolkit and you can pull them out when you know it's right. These are the tools. And I think, I don't know if Natasha yeah. mentioned, but we could share mm -hmm. the slides too after. So I think I already emailed it. Well, and I don't know if you were on that, but I emailed it. Yeah. Did you get it? Okay, okay. good. Yeah, so I have emailed it out and then I had it up for everyone online too, but yeah. yeah. And like, it, we love to talk about this stuff. It's something we're really excited about and passionate about. So if you want to follow up, anyone is interested in more conversations, email us, uh, get in touch. We'd love to talk to athletes about it if it's something that you think your teams would be really interested in too. We would love to make time for that. And uh, I know lots of big things are coming up in a lot of athletes' lives and in sport right now. So um, if any of this can be useful or even just one or two or something you want to dig a little deeper on, we can speak into that too. I just want to thank you guys. I thought that was really, really good. I love the structure of it, like that you gave us some nice tangible tools. And I do think there's a lot here that we can, that all coaches can use and apply. And yeah, I really appreciate how it was done. Um, I want to give a chance for questions. So online, I, I just wrote you guys there. If you want to either unmute, just let me know first um, so that we can hear you, but type in questions if you have them or if any of you guys in the room have any questions. It does seem like this has all made you like ultra aware of yourself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally, like, um, and I, you mentioned this in the last slide, like I was curious for you guys, if it's actually like bled into your everyday lives, like is this sort of automatic almost now, like with certain or other things, I guess that you do maybe daily that, yeah, that you find, this mindset kind of carries through and helps? I think like the short answer is yes. Okay. Like the long answer is that like all of these things are like a constant life practice and I'm just as capable of being hard on myself and um, falling down on some of these practices as anybody. Um, and then I think that on occasion, like when you have awareness that some of these practices exist, you can be hard on yourself for not using them. Um, and so that can sometimes be a challenge for me where I think, oh, no, turn it off. Like, yeah, yeah, turn it off. Yeah. Right? Um, but I, yeah. I was just going to say, there's like interesting places. Like we, we had a 19 hour drive back from Ontario yeah. after the holidays where like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's like strategies that we actually were talking about. Okay, like, let's try this one right now. And, and like, we have some language and shared, like shared practices around this now. That's very cool. Um, and I, I think that like, Sometimes people talk about ultras as being like life in a day. Like you experience so much on a run when you're running for this long and you're so close to your emotions. Uh, and I think that generally like ultras and sport are a really cool place for developing a lot of these skills that you can then apply in other parts of your life too. And I think your point about shared language is really important there because like I think because we have some shared language and some shared understanding, we can also like say, I need to turn it off for a little while. Um, and I think that we also probably have like a stamina for some of this stuff that probably we've accidentally built up over time. And so like, if, if you have 30 seconds of stamina for this, that's great, you know? And, and like, maybe someday you might have, you know, 34 seconds for it. And that's also great. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not like, a, you know, you need to be able to or want to do this for an hour, all these long conversations for hours and hours. It's, whatever little bits that you feel like are useful for you is, is great. Adam, I think you said you did some shorter distances before you yeah, yeah. drove into the deep end of ultra. Yeah. Um, did you find some of the strategies like, so for example, talking to cars, things like that, something that maybe you could get away with or didn't think about at a shorter distance, but definitely save you, like, you know what I mean? Like, like you could just say, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna tough this through. 
right? Or once you start doing a longer one, now you have to use them or you have to find some of these. Did you find some trend? That's a really there? interesting question because I haven't really gone back to short distances oh. since then. But I think that I think that the answer is probably a bit of yes and it's probably <laughs> yes. Like it does feel sometimes with an ultra that like you can't uh like you have so much time out there that you kind of have to deal with it eventually uh, like and i do well, so, so long yeah like it's so long so depleting yeah. right yeah. and everything and the time yeah. versus a friend of mine he didn't hardly he did a 10k and hardly train he just powered through it and he did a half and he's like yeah. Yeah. And then I'm just thinking, you take those next steps to a marathon and then the ultra marathon. It's like, yeah, what you can get away with at a short distance, these tools, I think, are lifesavers that belong. It makes I'm just, me. Yeah. Kelsey must have something to say about this because it cross country. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I, I ran ultras. And then when I started my thesis, which was really driven from all of this learning I was experiencing, like, I would never have imagined that I was doing a degree in sports psych before diving into all of this. And now it's like my bread and butter. It's so fun. Um, but yeah, I, I dabbled in cross country again last fall, which is like a totally different sport, short and fast. Uh, and actually, I think that like there are a lot of applications to that. I think maybe you're right that you can sort of tap it out and get away with it. Mm -hmm. But there's like a certain barrier that broke for me about like understanding how to really uh, like experience hurt and and toughness in that moment that I was like I can do this all out for 8k and because I have some of these ways of thinking and experiencing this I was faster than I I've ever been okay. before all right. yeah yeah and I also think of like um over a training cycle that you can you know even though a race or an event might be really short the experience of training for it is actually quite long and and sometimes like using some of these in that training is really helpful but can you get away with it without them? Probably. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking yeah. that there would have been an evolution, or do you know what I mean? Like there yeah. yeah. something there. Like, like I shouldn't be a fast, I should not be a fast cross country runner. I don't like. I just jumped into the sport and walked onto the team, and, and I was second at AUS that year, um, which was really surprising for me. I didn't think that I would be able to run that fast, but there was just something I think that clicked. Um, I did run cross country in my undergrad, and was much slower. But there's something else that happened along the way mentally I think. So, yeah. that makes me think like in, in training uh for me like a big breakthrough for me has been realizing that it's okay to run slow during training i never knew that i mean that's just sort of like a gap in knowledge i think is how i thought of it but in a way it's also related to this idea of like uh yeah having conversations with my parts and my mindset and things like that and i found so much more joy in training uh recognizing that uh like a, an easy run um will ladder up to faster fast runs but i just didn't know that and so i think that like that's just a great example of how like when you um uh, like i like i've allowed myself to experience my easy runs with more ease than ever before and it's it gives me more motivation to keep doing it like i think i would have probably burned out of running in about last summer if i hadn't this fall learned that. Um, and rest. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Kelsey's experience sounds so rare. Like you went from ultra and then did other things. Like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like most people probably have gone through this way and then. Yeah. So it's, it's, it just sounds amazing kind of to have gone to that extreme and then, yeah, like just be, oh, okay, what is it like to do the other ones? And, cool. and yeah, you, you built up that. Oh, it's okay to be slow. Where it's like normally, yeah, when you're training up, you're thinking, don't want to be slow. I can't rest. I can't take my time. But you like accepted it earlier. So it's mm -hmm. almost like, yeah, that mentally really seems to have helped you a lot. Mm -hmm. I think I learned that I like extremes too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah, it's kind of fun, like, but you're not too tough on yourself. Like, at the yeah. Time, not, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, acceptance. The, yeah. That piece is really important. Um, sorry, I have one more question. <laughs> um, just um, you mentioned like talking and like singing sometimes. Like, do you ever worry that you're expending energy or too much? Like, like now nah, I'm like 
yeah, talking or singing and then take away from my breath. Wasting like, those calories. Yeah, or like, yeah. or like, oh my gosh, like, does that ever happen? Or is it just <laughs> fun takes over? I think I, like, in my experience, I've wondered, you know, I think I've sort of wondered that too. Like, I, I when I'm around a lot of people, like, if the course overlaps with people, I spend a lot of time cheering people on while I'm running my race. And I wondered that. And I think I had a, a I had a more like, a focused competitive race uh, at reunion this year. Like I was like really, I think in my head about there was a few different things. Like I I wanted to compete. I thought I could do well. I was training for it really hard. Um, and there were moments when I didn't do that, and I think I was slower. Like I think I'm faster when I'm motivated. Yeah. And like that that for me pumps me up. So like maybe it uses some energy, but like the mental boost that it gives me is a trade off that I'm I'm excited by. Yeah, like it's a bit of an experiment. I know. That makes sense. That's how I'm yeah. 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 Yeah